Hi class, welcome to week three. Um, our third lecture, actually our second slide show, but our uh, third lecture about a new book. Babby is the book and he's pretty good about breaking things down in sort of layman's terms uh, where it feels real practical, hopefully. Hopefully that's how you felt when you were reading it. Um, so we're looking at chapter four as we continue our discussion uh, about how to design an excellent research project. So chapter four deals with, we will talk about all of these things. So here we go. All right, so there are three purposes of research. You might want to explore, a particular question, right? Uh, you might want to describe something, have specific answers to it, um, just describe what's out there, like the U.S. Census is a good example of describing what's out there. Or you might want to explain something. Why does this happen? Why does that happen? How does this happen? And all that stuff. So, exploration. Expand, expanding f foundational knowledge, exploring possibility, uh, possibilities of expanding a study. So this is sort of the um, the first step in establishing a framework for future studies. Um, an example of that, I guess I can use a case that I've done where I looked at how citizens and governments interact how they work together to produce public services. And there hadn't been a lot of work done about um, why people do it, um, who does it, what are some of the motivations, and so on. So my study, even though it was an explanatory study and a descriptive study, it was sort of its first, the first of its kind. So it allowed me to um, just uh, satisfy my curiosity and desire for better understanding. There might be some research, um, some literature out there, but not enough, not extensive um, enough to, to really hold on to. And so your exploration helps uh, you to, to develop the methods to be employed in a subsequent study. For example, conducting interviews with leaders on an emerging trend in high school education. In my case, uh, I did focus groups and interviews trying to understand what the right questions I sh uh, should be, uh, what the right questions are that should be asked in order to now go get down to the descriptive and in, in order to get down to the explanatory types of questions. So I had to do an explo exploration exploratory study explore to describe to explain now let's look at the different ways we might explain so we've got two different ways let me put all this out there um, we've got the ideographic explanation and the monothetic explanation this might seem like a whole lot of words and it may not make a lot of sense um, but here we go I, it will make sense once I've talked about it. That's what I'm trying to say. So with the ideographic explanation, um, we use this method to find an exhaustive understanding of the causes producing um, events and situations in a single uh, case or in a limited number of cases. Um, let me explain the monothetic explanation so that we can contrast. With the monothetic explanation, what we're trying to do is explain a general, uh, have a general understanding of, of why so-and-so happens. Uh, so with the ideographic, you might want to understand why Dr. Uzuchuku speaks uh, the way she does or why, um, better example, why she has this opinion about such and such, okay? Um, in a monothetic explanation, you are not simply wanting to understand your professor's viewpoint and what causes her to have this viewpoint. You want to make general 
generalizations about what causes people to have this viewpoint. I think I see light bulbs coming on. Um, so I'll continue. So ideographic, you're wanting to understand this particular person, these the small set of um, uh, cases. Okay, and ideographic is very useful for psychologists. A profession like psychology, they um, they might be interested in their one client. What what is the underlying reason for their behavior in this way? Right, this one person. Let's look at their history. Let's look at their parental, um, well, their um, their upbringing as a child. Let's let's look at where they went to school. Let's look at this. Let's look at that. Let's talk to her best friend. Let's talk to her husband. Let's talk to all these people um, and figure out what makes her who she is. Right now, a monothetic explanation says. Um, we want to understand what makes people generally who they are, right? And or excuse me, what makes more specifically because you typically don't want to just understand a very vague question like that. You have a very specific question, and you are wanting to generalize the answer to that question um, for a broader population. Okay. Finding um, a few factors that can account for many of the variations in a given phenomenon. Note that we're saying a phenomenon this time and not a person, not a number of uh, similar cases, but an entire event, entire way of thinking um, of one's opinion about abortion, right? That is a phenomenon and we don't want to just know what Professor K thinks we want to know what um, the general consensus is. Okay, so with that in mind, understanding the ideographic is about um, sort of just a one case, one person, and trying to understand, uh, get a deep, deep understanding of this one person. And the monothetic is about um, a generalization. Then let's think about the example of the legalization of marijuana. If we're thinking ideographically, right, you might say, well, let's talk to her parents, let's talk to her teachers, maybe her pastor, let's see some of her past experiences. Notice that all we're doing is getting people all in my little inner circle, people that know me, right, and no one that anyone that doesn't know me is not being interviewed, is not being asked anything um, when it comes to ideographic approach. Then a monothetic approach might be, we might ask all of these people and even more, right, possibly, um, questions uh, that are just general, right? Um, what's your political orientation? Are you um, liberal, moderate, conservative? What's your political party? Are you in the Green Party, Libertarian, Democrat? Um, you might want to know what your occupation is. Things that we can now use to sort of generalize about um, what helps to shape that person's uh, opinion about legalization, legalizing marijuana. Yay, I think we're good. I think we're getting it. So let's move on. Uh, much, how do I say, don't come with um, hypotheses, you don't really need to create, develop hypotheses, you don't need to do any real uh, deep studies, it's very qualitative, right, um, but a monothetic explanation um, comes with all of that, right, it doesn't have to, but of the two, this is the one that would right? This is the one where we, um, the variables need to be correlated in order for us to say this is what causes that or this is what's associated with that and that's a better word to use versus causality um, because we can't really talk about causation without a very controlled environment to say that that is actually what is causing that, the other thing. So correlation, an empirical relationship a tested 
relationship, a statistically tested relationship between two variables such that um, changes in one variable are associated with changes in the other or particular attributes in one variable are associated with particular attributes in the other. The cause takes place before the effect. That's how it should be, right? I cannot, um, my opinion cannot make me black. My opinion cannot make me um, older. <laughs> but um, in a generalization, one can say the older someone is, the more likely they are to have this opinion, right? Or black people are more likely to blank than white people. <laughs> Something like that, right? But cause and effect, cause has to come before the effect, okay? And then the variables have to be non-spurious. Spurious means coincidental. A coincidental statistical correlation between two variables shown to be caused by some third variable, but it can't just be coincidental. It has to be for real. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, causal analysis and hypothesis testing. Like I said, I uh, kind of jumped the gun there, but hypothesis testing is not required, but of the two, this is where you would do it. To test a hypothesis, you would specify the variables um, that you want to think, uh, to, excuse me, that you want to see if they're related in any way. I want to see if abortion and political party have any relation opinion about abortion and one's political party have any relation. So those are two variables. I want to specify the measurement of the variable. How did I measure it? Well, I use political party or I use political ideology and with political ide ideology I used liberal, moderate, conservative. Someone else might use very liberal, liberal, moderate, conservative, very conservative. So three point scales, the one I said, five point scale someone else is using. So measurement is important. Hypothesize the correlation, the strength, and the statistical significance. Um, we will look at that for sure in the second half of the semester. Right now it's not going to make a lot of sense until we start getting down to the nitty gritty numbers. Um, and then specify the test for spuriousness. And again, the second half of the semester, but we want to see if it's coincidental, purely coincidence, or if there's something really out there that's happening um, in the population. Interesting, and it makes me laugh because um, I'll show you the examples in the next slide. Um, but a necessary cause represents a condition that must be present for the effect to follow. A sufficient cause represents a condition that, if it is present, guarantees the effect in question. All right. Um, most satisfying outcomes in research include both necessary and sufficient causes. So let's take a, a look at what that looks like. All right, so necessary cause. This picture, and it's also in your book, um, provides an awesome pictor um, depiction of, of what necessary cause means. Being female is a necessary cause of pregnancy. That is, you cannot get pregnant unless you are female, correct? I hope we are all in agreement on that. If we're not, then God tell me something, please. <laughs> but um, so notice there's a um, four categories you can be in, male, pregnant, female, pregnant, male, not pregnant, female, not pregnant. And so in order to be pregnant, right, you have to be female. That is a necessary cause, okay? Not taking the exam is a sufficient cause of failing, even though there are other ways that you could fail. You could answer, ran answer randomly. You could, um, I don't know, you just did, you just didn't do well. Like you, you thought you studied, you thought you understood it, and and come to find out you didn't. Right. So, um, 
so sufficient cause so we can see here excuse me we can see here where all the F's are right um, F's can be I everyone that didn't take the exam right they are the top um, right hand side of this chart top right hand side right where they failed there are other F's right but they took the exam and for whatever reason they also failed but a sufficient cause for failing is for one at least we know you didn't take it there are other causes but one sufficient cause is you didn't take it Pictures are worth a thousand words, so I love pictures, and here before you are a thousand words, good people. So read it um, and understand it, um, but essentially it's talking about correlation here. The top one is showing that if something is correlated with one another, and this in this case a positive correlation, um, the bigger your shoe size, the uh, higher your math skills, right? Or because it's a correlation, it can be the other way. The higher your math skills, the bigger your shoe size. And that's positive. But if it was negative, one would be going up, one would be going down. So the, the bigger your shoe size, guess what would be happening in a negative relationship? The smaller, the lower your math score. Or the higher your math score, the lower your shoe size. See? Spurious causal relationships means neither shoe size nor math skill is a cause of the other so math skill does not cause shoe size to change shoe size has no um, association at all with math skills but then we look at the actual causal relationship what's happening here we see that there's an underlying variable called age that causes both shoe size and math skills to get bigger and so even though we see that as shoe size gets bigger math skills get bigger what's really happening is age as age increases um, shoe size gets bigger as age increases math skills get bigger but age is really what's causing things to go right um, the older you get the tall the the bigger your shoe size the older you get the more skills uh, you have mathematically you have and so it's not really about shoe size and skills although through age it is okay study um, conduct our study right we can use individuals right and we can use aggregates individuals or aggregates that could be um, individuals can be students you voters parents children Catholics anyone any category anything as long as there's one person um, that you can you can granulate it to one person is considered an individual when individuals cannot be brought to the granular granular wow granular level um, they are aggregates right so when we're talking about gang members we might not know one we might not have interviewed individual gang members we might have been looking at an entire group this gang that gang that gang we might be looking at the Uzuchuku family, the Smith family, the uh, Chiquim family, the the all these families, right? We might be looking at different households. We might be looking at organizations, GE, um, BGE, um, Walmart, McDonald's, different organizations, UB colleges, UMBC, UMD, right? All social interactions. It might be all the phone calls this phone call that phone call that phone call it might be this dance that dance that dance going into this chat room another chat room so looking at 5,000 chat rooms okay looking at um, uh, studying all 200 of the dances that have come uh, over the past 
20 years, right? Something like that. Artifacts. Artifacts are anything that help us understand humans, human behavior and so forth, or that were created, obviously, by humans, but books, poems, paintings, jokes, songs, anything that people can use in order to understand um, the uh, social behavior. Ugh, social behavior. <laughs> um, so, sample statements for unit of analysis. 60% of who? 60% of women, oh, excuse me, of the sample are women. 60% of the household have a single parent. 43% of families have at least two children. So what are we seeing in these uh, sample statements? We can see groups, households, families. So these percentages are of the different groups of this sample groups, right? And then it breaks it down into individuals. 20% of these households have single parents. But still, we're still talking about groups. This unit of analysis is still groups. faulty reasoning about this units uh, about units of analyses so um, we've got two here the two main ones the ecological fallacy and reductionism both of these are very bad and you've probably done it very innocently in the past um, things like stereotypes cause these fallacies and reductionism um, and um, things like racism and bigotry and uh, uh, different uh, just prejudices can lead us to to fall into one of these categories. So let's look at what they are. Ecological fallacy is erroneously uh, drawing conclusions about individuals solely from the observations of groups. Reductionism, a strict limitation, a reduction of the kinds of concepts to be considered relevant to the ph phenomenon under study. fallacy you find out that the average height in a class is is pretty high the average height in this classroom is 62 then you go wow so everyone that I see in the class everyone that I'm gonna see in this class is tall uh, and you go into the class and you find someone like me that's 5 3 ecological fallacy <laughs> the average might be high but that doesn't mean that now everybody is supposedly tall, right? Maybe the talls are a good chunk of the folks, but doesn't mean uh, that they're um, all that's there, okay? Here's another uh, example, right? All young people vote for Democrats. I know young people who don't. Um, and I, you know, we've got people that vote in all different ways. So just because you are young doesn't mean that you vote Democrat, right? You might be young and you vote Republican or you find your own party uh, to, you know, to cling to and, and you stick with it all the way till you die or you change. But just because a lot of young people are Democrats doesn't mean all young people are Democrats. Got it? <laughs> now reductionism. So you're doing a study, um, you're trying to understand poverty, you're really trying, and because of what you know, right, about poverty, that it has to do, um, you know, a lot of times black people fall into that category, hmm? um, right, education, because you don't have high enough education, you uh, can't get a, a good job that pays well or institutionalize racism and the legacy of slavery um, and Jim Crow laws that's, uh, you know, has caused a whole chunk of a population of black people to never have crawled out of poverty. The system is rigged, folks. <laughs> it is. So, um, that is reductionism. There might be other reasons. There might be other reasons, right, um, that can help us understand poverty. 
surely it can't just be race and education. Now that might be a huge part, just like we saw in the ecological fallacy that an average of a, of a height that's high probably means a lot of people are, are tall in that class, doesn't mean everybody is, right? So just because someone's poor, doesn't mean that they are black or that they have no educate low education right so so you might want to expand and see what else could have caused this you might want to expand your study of poverty beyond these two variables called race and education so that's it for fallacies that's what this means and i hope it made sense to you of um, uh, ways to study, do a, conduct a study. You can do cross-sectional study, a study based on observations representing a single point in time, a cross-section of a population. So you open up the population um, cookbook, or I don't know what you call it, call it a jaw, a, a jar and you and you just scoop out a few people uh, a, a chunk of folks that can represent uh, you think will re be representative of that entire population at that given point in time that's what a cross-section is okay longitudinal study is a study design involving the collection of data at different points of time cross-sectional one specific point of time and you just get a hand full of a sample that, that you think would represent what the population looks like at that one point in time. Longitudinal, we've got several points in time. So we're trying to find a trend which allows us to uh, move on to one type of longitudinal study which is a trend analysis or a trend study. So trend analysis is a study in which a, a given characteristic of some population is monitored. We'll look at that in the next slide, all three of these, what they look like. Cohort study, a study in which some specific sub uh, population or cohort is studied over time. Again, examples to come in the next slide. Panel study, a study in which Data are collected from the same set of people at several points in time. All of these three at multiple points in time versus cross-sectional one specific point in time and boom, we're done. That's the end of that study, right? Um, and so now let's look at how we can differenti differentiate these three longitudinal studies. Let's use the case of religious affiliation, okay? So with a trend study, you might look at the shifts in religious affiliation over the five-year span of the study. So you're conducting a study and you're going to do it once a year, right? Or you might do it every quarter for five years, whatever the, that time period is. In this case, it's five years, whether it's once a year for five years, a quarter, every quarter for five years, whatever it is, that's what you've decided. And a trend study says, we're just going to look at how things change every time we collect the data over this five-year period. It doesn't say we have to call on the same exact people. Nope doesn't say that in fact let's let's go up let's go back a bit and talk about um, cross-sectional okay the only difference between this trend analysis and a cross-sectional analysis is that the cross-sectional analysis remember it scooped up a representative sample for that particular point in time in the population the trend analysis did that same scooping up of a particular pop of of the entire population for that particular point in time right the next quarter scooped up another one for that particular point in time the next quarter it scooped up another one for that particular point in time right it did that for five entire years now let's go to cohort cohort looks at shifts in religious 
uh, affiliation, nothing's changed so far compared to trend, right? It looks at shifts in religious affiliation among those born during the Depression over the five-year span of the study. So it scooped up a particular people this time. It's not just the people representative of the population. It said, I need to scoop up. My scoop needs to be only those born during Depression. So I got a cohort of people born during depression so a specific age group right and that specific age group is what I am studying every single time I do my scoop I do my scoop doesn't have to be the same people but it has to be that same group a uh, age group age group okay now let's take it down to the final one the panel study it looks at a shift in religious affiliation among a specific group of people over the five-year span of the study something's changed right so in this scenario it's not just oh I'm looking at a specific age group of people born during depression no it says I scooped up people uh, whatever that specification is those handful of people not maybe not specifically handful it could be 5,000 people that's not a handful right but that group that panel that is what I will, every time I do this study, I'm calling on those same 5,000 people. The same. Not scooping up anymore, right? If those people, after the third year, somebody has a heart attack and dies, or, or someone just says, you know what, I don't want to do this survey anymore. I, I don't want to be part of this study anymore. They fall off. There's no adding new people, new subjects, right? There's, there's, if they fall off, they fall off, right, of the study. For whatever reason, they've fallen off. But the panel is still the panel. And it can't, you cannot change it. So trend analysis, trend study, you just get people, every, you do a scoop each time, right? It's cohort study, you do a scoop of a specific group, in this case, age group. And then panel study, you do a specific scoop, and that scoop, you stick with it the whole time you do that study. All right, I've talked too much. <laughs> On to the next slide. These researchers can draw approximate conclusions about these uh, longitudinal processes even when cross-sectional data is not available. So um, imply, process, imply processes over time, make uh, logistic inferences, ask individuals to, to recall past behavior. That's really critical here. That's very critical. Um, longitudinal Cross-sectional data does this too, but um, surveys in general will require you to pull on um, and and re and bring to memory things of the past. That's just what it does. Okay. So research design elements, we're all we're towards the end now. We saw this already, sort of, in the first two lectures. We understand that research design entails these, um, you know, thinking about the, the question, um, defining the question, um, conceptualizing that question, um, collecting the data, narrowing down the data, all that, coming up with alternatives, trade-offs, yada, yada right we've learned that in the first two weeks so now we're taking a little different approach here um, to expand what we know not to not to limit it but to expand what we already know okay so getting started from previous weeks we know that we have to define the problem and now we know that defining the problem entails us understanding which category this problem is is it are we exploring, are we describing, or are we explaining? That's, that's part of understanding that problem. So now we're able to tack that on to our problem definition part that we learned 
uh, last two weeks. Conceptualization. So defining the meaning of each concept you want to study. Conceptualizing. So whatever it is for me, I do a lot of community development work and citizen participation work. So I have to conceptualize. I have to describe exactly what participation means. Are we talking picking up trash outside my house or going to a park to pick up trash or um, are, are we talking going to city council meetings? Conceptualize it. What does it mean? Community development. What does that mean to you? What does that mean for the study? Right? So conceptualization is critical because you can say these words and and if you don't conceptualize it, define it, give it the meaning that you mean, you meant for it for the study, people will read it to mean whatever they want it to mean or not read it because they'll say, gosh, that could mean anything. All right. And then your choice of research method. We will talk about that a little bit more uh, as the semester goes on, but we did talk a little bit about it um, in the second first and second weeks also. So knowing, um, coming up with your alternatives, coming up with your data, collection methods, all of that is part of uh, this. So operationalization, don't you love that word? Determine how you will measure your results, okay? How are you gonna measure it? Um, are, you, are you doing a, uh, survey are you are you doing interviews how are you operationalizing it in terms of how many times someone goes out a week uh, a month a year to go pick up trash in their neighborhood or do a neighborhood watch in their neighborhood frequency that's one way you could um, operationalize it but you have to determine how what that's gonna be right um, you have to now look at the population, determine what or whom you are going to study. That takes us to our unit of analysis. Are we studying an individual? Are we not in? Well, we could be if it's ideographic, ide right? Um, but are we studying individuals um, towards generalizing about something? Or are we studying um, groups, right? Um, how are we going to sample? Right, so that moves us into our next question of how do we collect our data, and then the second half of this semester we're going to learn how to process our data. Fun, fun. How to analyze our data, even more fun, and then how to report our findings. Just writing, right? <laughs> Not just writing, because there's an art to it, and a science to it. Examples fleshes it out a little bit more what I talked about in the previous slide. So one thing I want to point out is like the uh, choice of research method, which is kind of smack dab in the middle there. You can do experiments, surveys, uh, field research, content analysis. All of these are really um, very different and very interesting depending on the study at hand and what you are trying to accomplish. And really the resources that you have because experiments are probably the most ideal type of uh, research method but it can be the most costly. <laughs> so we've got the elements of a research proposal which you will be creating, yay! Um, and so we've, hopefully you've done a lit review before. If you haven't, we'll, um, we talked about it a little bit the first couple of weeks also, but collecting, gathering all the information you need to justify why you're doing the study, um, understanding the subjects for the study, the measurements, the, the, the tools, the methodology, uh, the analysis, what's your schedule going to be for this, uh, do you want to be done with this in five years, in three months, uh, how are you going to do this budget wise, and then IRB, Institutional Research, excuse me, Review Board, and I'm going to go to the next slide to talk about that. It's privacy and uh, well-being are protected, 
It should indicate how your study will abide by the ethical structures of social research. It may be appropriate for your research proposal to undergo in, uh, IRB Institutional Review Board review and approval. Anytime um, a study has to do with people, an IRB is pretty much required. Um, it, it, the board is there to make sure that no one gets hurt. You know, we've got uh, things in our past um, where researchers have not been very ethical, have not been very responsible. Um, Tuskegee, Johns Hopkins, and all had to do with um, treating black people like they are not humans. But we have this board in place now, and it's international, so it allows um, there to be sort of a watchdog to ensure that people are not harmed for the sake of expanding knowledge. Knowledge is good. Um, but if your study requires the participation of human subjects, you must determine that the likely benefits of the research will do justice to the time and effort you will ask of them. Very important. Sometimes people give incentives. I have in the past. You know, you could win a $50 Visa card. Um, oh, you know what? Before I end, I just thought about something. Um, I keep mentioning, you know, well, I not keep mentioning, but I mentioned Tuskegee and Johns Hopkins and their unethical um, research uh, methods. But they do that not just in, in, in along the lines of race. They've done that for, you know, mentally dis impaired people, you know, handicapped people. So that's why things are in place now. We thank God for that, where vulnerable populations are not at risk of harm. All right. I think that's it. Thanks, guys.